OK, so as we're waiting for my laptop to do its thing, uh, no, I don't need it. It's OK. Thank you, though. Um, I have uh, GIFs. I like interactive talks. So I have a few GIFs that I will give to people who are brave enough to ask questions. It's really hard for me to see the people in the back row. So if you really want one of these 16 gigabyte USB 3 sticks, settle down. Down. That's not down. That's so naughty. Um, raise your hand and ask a question anytime, except for the que what question can't you ask? Can I have a stick? That does not get you a stick, all right? So uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm, I put this as daily development with Kubernetes and OpenShift in 20 minutes or less. That's me. That's all the places you can find me. This, that's a zero, because I'm leet like that. Um, and then you can actually even use that to get to me at Red Hat if you need to email me. That link at the bottom is actually the link to these slides. So, and I'll repeat that slide at the end, so you don't have to worry about getting it right now, and it's up higher there. Uh, all right, let's get started. Goals, demo, 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 and along the way, some concepts. So is that OK, goals with everybody? OK. Uh, what I'm going to be showing today, we're going to be using uh, the open, con open containers. So containers, that could be Docker containers, it could be Rocket, basically anything that Kubernetes can orchestrate. I'm assuming everybody here knows about Kubernetes. Is that a good assumption? Yes. And everybody knows about containers. I don't have to, I don't have to do the whole, that. it's so nice being at this stage in our evolution now where I don't have to talk about that anymore. So what I'm going to be showing is OpenShift. Um, surprise, surprise. Uh, that's also why I wore this. So when you watch the video or you see me speaking, know that I'm coming from a particular slant. I'm not trying to hide anything. Um, what OpenShift actually focuses on, though, is building experience on top of Kubernetes for developers. Right? That's part of why it's, it's reason for existence. So that's why I'm going to talk about it. Why OpenShift? You want more out of containers. You want more out of Kubernetes. And you like working on the things that you like to work on rather than managing Kubernetes. right? So brief side note on the relationship to Kubernetes. This is straight Kubernetes underneath. I know our name is OpenShift. I kind of want our name to be Red Hat Enterprise Kubernetes. No one agrees with me about that, so it's OpenShift for now. Um, it is just like Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So when you buy Red Hat Enterprise Linux, do we just give you a Linux kernel? No. Front row. OK. So see how hard that answer was? It was just like two letters. And he just got himself like $600 worth USB key. Um, so uh, <coughs> you can take that in mind as I start to show more of my demo, too. Um, so the point being is we don't just give you Kubernetes, right? In the same way, this is our new Kubernetes is our cloud kernel, so, or our cloud Linux. So what we're doing is we're using it as the kernel to build an ecosystem around. The other thing is, do we own the Linux kernel? OK, you said that for And you actually tolerated my dog being close to you. So the um, we don't own the Linux kernel, and we don't own Kubernetes, right? So that's the same idea here. We do all of our work upstream, which brings us to some of these points. It's straight Kubernetes underneath. We're not forking it and doing something weird with it. You can, if you want to see it later in the demo, I'll show you which version of Kubernetes it actually is. You can actually even use the kubectl command to interact with the OpenShift. In the beginning days when Kubernetes was a bit rough, actually the Kubernetes engineers were standing up OpenShift because it was an easier install and interacting against that. Um, we don't use all the Kubernetes objects. So there are a ton of Kubernetes objects. There's more so now. Sometimes we have our own. So when Kubernetes first came out, there was no way to route a URL to it. We had a route. Now there's an ingress. We don't believe that ingress matches what a route is capable of. So until they become feature complete, we'll keep using our route for now. Does that make sense? It's not that we just had to make one when we first came out because we launched on Kubernetes 1.0. The other thing is, sorry? Question. OK, let's see if it's a good one. Um, so the question was, there's things that we're rolling upstream. So like we're helping on ingress, right? Our, they're informing that. The same thing with deployments. Like we had deployment configs, now there's deployments. The question was, when there, there's feature parity, are we just going to say ours are all gone and the rest are, and we're just going to switch to deployments? No. That's not how Red Hat does things, right? So there'll be, there'll be a period, th any version you buy, you have, I think it's a five-year support lifecycle on OpenShift. So that's the reason why people also get Kubernetes from us is because it's, you can get five years' worth of support on it. That was actually a good question. I'll give you a stick for that. OK, and then we wrap other ones. So there's other ones like the replication controller. We actually wrap, actually wrap that with a deployment config, because replication controllers were all we had when we started. 
and we didn't think it did enough, so we actually made a deployment config. I'm not going to go too much into details. Is that okay with everybody? Because we have 20 minutes. I'm actually just going to try to show a demo. Are we good? I think that's it for the slides. Yeah, that's slides. Do you want more slides, or should I just go to demo? I can keep. So, so you sure you don't want like 35 more slides? Okay, so let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is to show you how easy it is to deploy a Docker image. So the f we're going to do. You guys like Web Console or Command Line? Okay, so Command Line wins. All right, so let's just make sure I'm logged in. So that's what to make sure I can read it. OC login. So what we're doing here is we're using our command line tools to talk to this cluster I've deployed in Google, GCE, but I could have deployed this in AWS or Azure or anywhere else I wanted to deploy it. Um, and this is actually using the same REST endpoint. It's using REST endpoints to call in that the web CLI is as well. So now we're in there. We need to make a new project. So a project, for those of you who are knowledgeable of uh, Kubernetes, a project is a materialized namespace. I'll call the project win because that's all I ever do. Um, and so there I've made a new project. That's a new namespace now in Kubernetes. We all good? Okay. So now I know you guys don't like me watching, typing, putting in typos. So I'm actually, I have a script because typos are no fun. So what I'm going to do here, can everybody see that? Right? So basically what I'm saying, OC new app. New app is a command that we say do the right thing. Take something that's not necessarily a Kubernetes object and do the right thing to make it runnable in Kubernetes and OpenShift. Make sense? So we're going to give it a Docker image. Does that look like a Docker image to everybody? Yeah? Docker repository, namespace, image. And it's going to be called Nginx. And so it's going to go through. And so you see it spit out a whole bunch of stuff. It spit out a whole bunch of stuff because it's doing the right thing. If you just put a Docker image into a pod, is that going to do much? in Kubernetes land? No. You just have a pod sitting there by itself. So it actually also makes, by default, it makes the image stream, it makes a deployment config, it makes the service. You can't all see it down there, but that's what it's doing. So that's doing that. If I go back to my web interface, I like visualizing things better in a web interface, if that's OK with everybody. There's the project. There's the pod. It's running. Right? So if you had a, and I'll now I want a URL to it, because Nginx by itself is not that fun. So here we go. We're going to make a route which you can think of as an ingress. I've now got a route, and I've got my awesome web page. <laughs> you don't like that? So the reason why that's happening is that Docker image actually specifies a volume mount. So if we go back here to the deployment config, and I look at the configuration, you can see that it mounts. There is a mount call for Nginx HTML. And so what Docker did, what, oh, not Docker did, what OpenShift did was it actually made a empty dir on the node to hold that. Does everybody get what that did? Right? So there's nothing in it. And so if there's nothing there and we go to serve it up, what's Nginx going to say? There's no content. So we need to fix that. So I'm going to fix it really quickly. And this gets into some of the stuff that developers can do. This part is actually really uh, important for people who work in dynamic languages like PHP or Python where you don't have to do the whole compile cycle, and you do normally do rapid development. So what I'm going to do back over here, and I'm going to get that to the top of the screen. Is that big enough for everybody in the back, in my age group? Yeah? OK. So I'm going to go to, you don't want to actually see me type this out, because I'll make a typo. But what I'm going to say here is rsync. So what I'm saying is, hey, rsync, this HTML folder right below me, up into the running pod. It says, oh, this worked last night. Let's see if it worked. What it should have done was it should have R synced it up. Oh, well, you know what? That didn't work. So let's just do this. In I think I just unplugged it. Let me do this instead. That doesn't stop it. We can actually do it this way. I can go in here, and I can actually go into the running pod. So I'm actually now in the running pod. So I can go cd slash engine x html echo favorite development phrase. And I think it, Unix heads, is it this? Right? I reload my page, and it worked. Right? So that's an ephemeral change, though. Everybody knows that, right? Like if I, we'll see this in a second, that's going to go away.
But this is really important for people who don't want to go through building an entire Docker image every time they want to see a change. How many of you in here are devs? Like six, seven of you? Like when you're actually doing your dev work, you don't actually want to sit there and go through a whole Docker image deploy build cycle, right? You're usually doing small changes. What does it look like? Small change, what does it look like? So you can actually, with this OCR sync, if it had actually been set up on my laptop, my Windows box, you can do an OCR sync dash W, and it'll keep watching that folder. And anytime you save a change, it'll automatically copy it up there. So you do your quick work, quick, 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 quick. Oh, I like it. Now I'll commit it to the entire cycle and do the build and deploy. Make sense? OK. And we'll see that in a little bit. Uh, how are we doing on time? Because I'm talking too fast, I can't tell how much time I have left. Is there a, oh, that clock is accurate? Yeah. All right. I was going to show you health checks, but I'm going to skip that for now, and if we have time, all I'm going to, all I'm going to tell you is that because it's Kubernetes underneath the hood, for free, if I go to the deployments, right, and I go to this one, under configuration, there's health checks. So I can actually set automatic probes that live in the platform. I don't have to write anything. I can set an automatic probe that lives in the platform. There's a readiness one and a liveness one. The liveness one just says, is this the container alive? And if it's not, it's going to restart it. Ready? How many of you are Java devs? Yeah. So how long does it take for your app server to come up before? What's the difference in time between your app server coming up and the content being ready? It can be minutes sometimes, right? If you have a particularly complicated application. And so what the readiness probe lets you say is, don't actually deploy this until it's actually ready to serve content. So those are the two probes you can get for free. If we have time, I'll show you how to set them up. All right. So now I'm going to show you how easy, this is command line again. This is how easy it is to start up a master replica streaming PostgreSQL. So what I'm starting up here is the master. And so what this is actually doing is it's reading JSON. So most of you said that you were Kubernetes aware. Do you know that Kubernetes uses a declarative model of, de of deployment? Does that sound right to everybody? De what? Declarative, yeah. Yeah. So this is actually reading in that JSON that was declared as the truth and telling the cluster, go make it so. And so I do this. I go back to my project. And I've now got the master pod running. Right? And it's actually got PG Badger and PG Collect running inside of that as well. So I get logging if I want that as well. So now I want the replicas to come up. Come on. <clears throat> Let's do it this way then. So I go back here, paste it again. And so for those of you that were devs in the room, or even or a manager or something like that, You've, I've always known that I should be running master replica databases, right? Actually, I'm not stalling either. It'll be really fast in the background. I just want to show you that it's fast. Where's the replica? There. The replica is already up. So what I've, actu what I've actually done now as a developer is some system administrator or person who really knew Postgres wrote that truth, gave it to me, and now I as a developer can feel comfortable that I now have a master replicated Postgres UL instance. Right? Have, it, have any of you tried to set up master slave replicated Postgres? Yeah, how many days did it take you? A couple of hours. And do you do that? Are you usually a sysadmin kind of person, though? Yeah, so a sysadmin and DBA took a day. So how long did it take me? Nothing, right? And want to see me scale up? There. Now I'm going to have two replicas, right? So this is the power of a declarative platform, the power for developers, and the power for you, though, too. So I don't want to, I mean, we're all excited because we got it. But the thing is for you, how many times have DBA, I mean, developers come to you and set things up wrong, right? So this is one of the things that OpenShift does really well is a separation of concerns. Sysadmins, DBAs, the experts can set up templates and say, this is what you will use. This is the guaranteed version of how this app should be configured. Use this. You spend your time doing the stuff you like doing, which is writing code. I'll make sure you get the database the way you want it. Right? And so that's the power of what's happening. So now I'm also, I already showed you this once, but I'm going to load data into this database. Let's go here, terminal. I don't want to be in the PG Badger one. I want to be in the master. So now we're going to load up database. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to do shell for my machine. You want to do that? How about that? Copy and paste works a little better there. So let's go back to the top. So now I'm shelled into that master, right? I said I want the container PG. 
I'm actually operating against that container itself. And then I'm going to use this command. Ah. Why aren't you, am I pressing the wrong button? There we go. So there, it's now, I've uploaded 546 da data points into the database. And I could have actually scripted this as part of the deployment. I could have said, go do that exact command I just did, go and grab that, because the data's all on GitHub, right? So the other power, and I'll show this at the end, but I want to say it now before, in case I run out of time, which has been known to happen to me before, is I can actually define my entire application, including the data and the source code, and put it into one of these JSON files. And so when a new developer comes to the team, you say, fork this GitHub repo, take this JSON file, change it to your GitHub repo, load it up, and you've got the working application with all the pieces on day one. So they've, they've already experienced a huge win day one. It's not like, okay, spend the next week installing all this software on your laptop, which is going to be installed differently than it's going to be on the server, and we can't give you access to it. They can set the whole, even in a microservices, they can actually have all the services running in their own project. It's not stubbing against other services. They can have it all there, and you can define it and share it. So I think that's actually really powerful. Do you guys trust me that the data is in there, or do you want to see it? You trust? What? You, no key for you. You actually owe me a key. All right. So uh, <laughs> let's see. Where, are we done with the database stuff? Yeah. So now I'm going to do code. So this is the other part that I think is interesting. For Oh, I'm going to do it from here, because it's actually important that we do it from here. This is another command line one. Because we're going to add environment variables to the deployment config so that the pod can see them. So let's get out of there. Ugh. OK. So let's go back up here. So I'm going to do another OC new app. And so this one looks a little different, if you can see it. It says Python 3.5 tilde, and then it's pointing to a GitHub repo. So what that's saying is, use our Python 3.5 builder image, use this Git repo, add these environment variables. So the first question people are going to ask is, Steve, you said the word something image. I said the word something image. No, not Python. B, B. Builder. Mm. You guys, pay attention. All right, so you're supposed to say, Steve, I want a key. What's a builder image? But now no keys for you. So the thing is that we support three builds in OpenShift. And I want to, this I'm going to go to a slide because I think it's kind of important. I'm going to, we support, um, Docker build, right? You give us a Docker file, and we'll build and deploy and do all that stuff. We support custom, like you have your own build thing that you like to do. And I'm not talking about a build pipeline. I'm talking about something specific to build a Docker image. But what we have here is builder images. And so what a builder image is, and this is some, using something called source to image, is it's a Docker image whose only purpose in life is to build other images. So it has a script in there that you can make yourself. So the DBA can make it, the system administrator who knows Node or wants people to use Node in a certain way. It has a script in there that when you give it a set of source code, you take that image and the source code, it actually combines the two together and spits out a new Docker image. And then pushes that into our integrated registry. We have a registry in OpenShift, which then the platform sees and says, oh, there's a hook. Let me go and deploy that. That image is now there. So let's go back to the, does that somewhat make sense? I went through that really fast. But if you go to the overview again, there's our master. There's our image. There's our replica. There's our, you can see there's a build now. And if you look at the build, we can look at the build logs. That's, for those of you who are Python devs, that's a normal build. Right? It's just doing the requirements pull. So for Maven people, that's like one-tenth the amount of pulls that it would normally have to do. But it's doing the exact same thing. It's doing some build. And then it's pushing a Docker image. So that's it, pushing it into the Im registry. If I now go to the overview again, there's that. I create a route. I create, the, I create the route. I click on it. And there's my app. And now, because I also put data in there, there's the, there's the database. It's pulling data from the database right there. Right? And so the way this worked is, by making it a pod, that automatically inserted the connection variables into the other pod. So the, the, the Python pod automatically saw the connection, like the host, the port, all that stuff, 
automatically for the database. And what I had to add, if you look back here, is the environment variables for the name of the database, the user, and the password. And that all gets inserted in, and it works, and it just starts reading from the database. OK? So I have 20 seconds left. Most of you will never use this cycle. Most of you will probably, we have a, hold on, I'll give you a key no matter what, because I just want to get through my messages. Um, so did you miss? All right, so the, the, the message I want to say here is most of you will probably have your own Jenkins instance, and you'll just push your things directly into our registry. But for the day-to-day -day development of a developer, they may not want to go through that entire Jenkins cycle, so they can use this as well. Plus, you as the administrator can actually make it. Okay, you can make that builder image. Last thing, the wrap-ups. You can do tutorials if you want. You can go to sign up for free for online usage. Of course, we have the enterprise version that you can buy and do all that stuff with. Here's if you want to actually install a cluster locally on your machine. Here's the actual work. If you want to actually run the entire workshop I did today, with including blue-green deploys and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then that's the finish. So that's the link to the slide. So take a picture of that one if you really want all the other stuff I put in there. And with that, I'm done. All right.